everybody, this is Nick Newton. I'm reading here for Will Miles today. Will Miles traveling back home after attending the Florida versus Utah game over the weekend. Great win for the Gators. Fired up to talk about it throughout the week here, but I'm going to read to you Will's recap of the game that dropped on readingreaction.com on Sunday morning. So since Will Miles is actually the author of the article, I thought we'd do the honors of having Will Miles read to you It might be my voice, but we'll put Will Miles on the screen here. There we go. That's better. Have Will up there. And, uh, hey, maybe we will have the dub a little bit be like Bruce Lee-style movies back in the day. But uh, at least you get to see Will while he's reading his article here. So let's dive right into it. The Gators take down the Utes. Keys to Florida's 29-26 victory over Utah. Every once in a while in college football, You get a game or a moment that takes your breath away. When you get both, it's a reminder of why the sport is is truly the greatest in the world. Whether it is the whipping of Old Miss in 2015, the 4th and 14 to Antonio Callaway, the heave to Cleave in 2017, the Burrow pick 6 in 2018, or the LaMichael P. Ryan run against Auburn in 2019, there have been a a lot of special moments in the Swamp. But I can't imagine that any of those moments or games were any better than the opening salvo in the Billy Napier era as Anthony Richardson proved to be everything we thought he could be. And then the much maligned Amari Bernie came up with an interception that sealed Utah's fate. The Gators went one and four in one score games last season. That included an early 31-29 loss to Alabama that set the tone for what was to come in the 2021 season. In fact, as Ventro Miller dropped what seemed like a surefire interception on the second play of the final drive, I had flashbacks to that Alabama game when Brenton Cox dropped into coverage against Alabama and dropped a Bryce Young throw that hit him right in the stomach. A few plays later in that one, Alabama scored to keep Florida on its heels. But against Utah, with overtime seeming like best-case scenario for, for the Gators, rising went for the kill, and Bernie read his eyes and stepped in front. It was a cathartic moment for a guy who many Gator fans didn't want to come back, both because of the result, but also because it came against against a former linebacker, Gators linebacker, Mamu Diabate, who many Gator fans were upset to see leave. Add that story to the emergence of Anthony Richardson as the player who you want leading a last-minute drive, and Gator fans have to be over the moon. Richardson's throwing stats weren't spectacular, but he proved what we thought we knew about him last season. His upside isn't just good. It's truly special. College football comes at you fast. Kentucky is coming into the swamp next week, and a loss in that one will make people forget the good vibes from this one pretty fast. But the discussion, but that discussion can wait until later in the week. For now, the Gators can bask in the glow of a win over a top 10 team and the knowledge that they can hang with just about anyone in the country. Not all one-score games are created equal. As I was sitting in the stands, to me it felt like two things were true. First, Florida was constantly playing from behind, but second, it felt like Florida had the upper hand. That seems weird to say for a game that was decided on an interception that prevented the opposition from forcing overtime. But if we take a look at the advanced stats. That's exactly the story that they can tell. Collegefootballdata.com has a bunch of stats that I've started to follow much more closely the past couple of years. My favorite stat is called post-game win percentage, which is a measure of how often the team would have won the game if the game was played again with the exact same stats. The post-game win percentage in this game, the Gators would have won 99% of the time. So why is that true? Well, I think we can point to very few distinct things. The first is that the stat takes the entire game into account, and Utah wasn't very good in the first half. The Utes had zero explosive plays, only had 134 yards of total offense, and averaged 4.3 yards per play. Florida had two explosives, 248 yards, and averaged 7.8 yards per play. The fact that the Gators only had one point lead at half was not reflective of their dominance early in the contest. 
That's because the Gators couldn't stop shooting themselves in the foot. The obvious one is the fumble on the opening drive, which Utah returned deep into Gators territory and a potential three or seven point lead for Florida turned into a seven point deficit with Utah only having to gain 25 yards. But that wasn't the only one. After Utah drove 50 yards for a field goal and a 10-7 lead, the Gators pinned themselves deep in their own territory with a holding penalty on Jordan Pouncey. After a three and out and a 39-yard punt returned 10 yards, Utah was able to tack on another field goal. After the goal line stand, Florida was ahead 14-13 and driving into Utah territory, but on third and five, Florida jumped off sides and forced Richardson into a third and 10 opportunity he wasn't able to convert. But Florida did a couple things really, really well. First, the Gators had four scoring chances, opportunities inside the opponent's 40-yard line, and scored 22 points, 5.5 points per opportunity. Conversely, Utah had seven possessions inside the Florida's 40-yard line and only came away with 26 points, 3.7 points per opportunity. Normally, when a team gets inside the opponent's 40-yard line three more times in a game, that means they dominated the game. But that wasn't the case here. Instead, the reason for this disparity is that Florida averaged, our Florida's average starting position was 81.6 yards from the end zone, while Utah's was 67.3. The end result is that Florida dominated Utah on predicted points, added PPA by a significant margin. 0.5059 0.5059 versus 0.2223 but the game was still close that should be a significant that should be a significant confidence boon for the Gator fans as it suggests that Florida didn't skate by with this victory but actually played way better than the score indicates defensive improvement the Gators defense was not great against Utah You can't ever call a defense great that gives up 446 yards and 6.3 yards per play. But you can acknowledge that while also acknowledging that this was a major improvement for a unit that struggled last season. For the most part, the defense kept Cam rising and checked through through the air. His QB rating of 129.5 was well below last season's average of 146.7. That was important because Rising was extremely effective on the ground, averaging 13 yards per rush and running for 91 yards. The result was that Rising had a PPA for the game of 0.320, which is good but not great. Last season, he was well above 0.424, and a yards above replacement, YAR, my proprietary statistic, for quantifying a QB's value in the passing and running game of 1.24, which qualifies him as better than good, but not elite. As mentioned above, Utah didn't have any explosive plays in the first half, but as the Gators' defense wore down in the third quarter, those started to come. Utah had five in the second half, and those were a big reason that the Utes were in Florida territory for what seemed like the entire second half. Of course, the biggest improvement for the defense last year came in the red zone, where the Gators of last year would have given up touchdowns multiple times to Utah that they didn't give up on Saturday night. There's obviously the interception by Bernie, but one that sticks out in my mind is as perhaps the play out of the game is this one. For anyone that doesn't uh, is not reading Will's article in, in, in addition to listening to this, I would highly recommend you check out what Will posts on Read Reaction. We can't post the videos here due to copyright issues, but I post an image of it here for y'all. Will breaks down this play here. It's a little swing pass. It's a little swing pass out here, and he shows how uh, Florida corrals it here with four defenders and just good group tackling here. This play came with Florida down 10-7 and clinging to keep things close because of all of its mistakes. My theme coming into this year was that Florida's defense would be better if everyone just learned to do their jobs rather than try to make them rather than try to make the play themselves. This play is a great example of that. The first thing you'll notice is that Travis Johnson is the player who is being blocked by the wide receiver on the on this play. Johnson not only takes on the blocker, but he drives him back behind the line of scrimmage. This forces the Utah receiver to stop and cut back toward the middle. 
but he can't cut back because of the pursuit by the Gators. That's Gators, plural, because Rashad Torrance, 22, Shamar James, 6, and Ventrell Miller, 51, are all coming to make sure that Utah is going to have to kick. The interception by Bernie and the drop by Miller are obviously things that we'll probably think of when this game comes up in our minds years from now. But this play by Johnson is indicative of the difference that the switch from Todd Grantham to Patrick Tony may portend. The Anthony Richardson experience. Anthony Richardson only threw for 168 yards and had a QB rating of 129.6, just barely better than rising. Yet anyone who watched the game knows that he was the difference between a Gators loss by probably two touchdowns and pulling out the win. His PPA for the game was a staggering 0.657. His YAR was 1.78, which is just getting towards elite level play and is higher than Kyle Trask yar for the 2020 season that comes both from his running ability 11 rushes for 106 yards and the timing of those runs that's how you end up with a 14 play game winning drive dominated by a QB who only throws the ball twice it's pretty clear that Richardson is still limited in the passing game the Gators weren't doing anything all that exotic and they were able to get a bunch of the passing yards on plays that utilize his running ability to open things up we've heard all offseason of the flood concepts that Napier's offense likes to use and they used it extensively against the Utes a flood concept is having a short intermediate and long route all on one side of the field That makes the read easier for the QB, but Richardson adds an extra dimension. Because he is a running threat, if the defense fails to account for him, he has the ability to take off for significant yardage. As you can see here, Will circles both the short and and the intermediate routes on this particular play from the television camera angle. Back to Will's article. This play is a great example It's actually right after they ran the exact same concept while backed up at their own half-yard line. The wide receiver at the top, Ricky Pearsaw, runs a go route, the long route. Tight end Dante Zanders, 18, comes across the formation, first pretending to block and then going out for a short route. Finally, Justin Shorter, four, is in one-on-one coverage and uses the official to maximize separation. It's easy to read for Richardson as Shorter is wide open for the first down. The Gators' running game took over in the fourth quarter. In particular, in particular, Montreal Johnson. Johnson had four straight runs, one, 17, nine, and 14 yards to put Florida up 22-19 early in the quarter. Obviously, Johnson has a lot to do with that, but Richardson is lurking in the shadows for why these plays are successful. The Utah defensive end, number 83, Jonah Ellis, stays incredibly deep to make sure Richardson doesn't roll out, as he had pretty much the entire game. At that point, the offensive line forms a wall, and Johnson does what we've talked about all offseason, puts a foot in the ground and cuts back into the open seam, into an open seam. This run might have worked even if the defensive end had been able to crash the running back, but he's nowhere near the play, specifically because of Richardson. Finally, there are just plays that make you go, wow. And Richardson did a lot of fundamentally sound things in the in the game, many of them unspectacular. But the two-point conversion shows the things that he can do that nobody else can. Again, the defensive end stays with Richardson rather than crashing to stop the running back. The intent of the play is to get the ball out to Naquan Wright running out into the flat. Wright is open. And Richardson even thinks about throwing the ball to him. But then the magic took over. Richardson brings the ball back down, twirls, and then finds Jaquavian Frazier's wide open in the end zone. This isn't a play you can teach. It isn't a play that's always going to turn out well either. But what it means is that the opposition is going to always have to account for plays that are outside the norm with Richardson in the game, which is going to open up the normal plays that hit bigger than they otherwise would have. Takeaway, you couldn't have asked for a better opening for Napier and the Gators. It's not often that a season opener takes place against a top 10 opponent. It's not often that Florida always plays a Pac-12 team. 
It's not often that Florida is an underdog in the swamp. It was not clear cut that Florida should come out on top, especially given the way those two teams ended 2021. But as I wrote in my preview, these teams were way closer in 2021 than the final records indicated, and the game pretty much played out that way, I thought. Florida was able to run the ball late to put the game away. Rising was good, but not great. And Richardson played like a guy who had the ability to not just be an elite talent, but a player we talk about years from now to our grandkids. What I didn't expect was that the Gators would dominate the advanced statistics portion of the game. Mistakes kept Utah close, but this game could have been a runaway if Florida had been clicking on all cylinders. That's my big takeaway from this game. Yes, Florida got a big win over a top 10 team, but that could have been based in luck or or been a fluke. But this wasn't a fluke. Florida is a good team. I think Utah is a good team too. I don't think they're on the same level as Alabama or Georgia. But then again, Utah doesn't have Anthony Richardson. And by the time Florida faces the Bulldogs, Richardson will have six more starts under his belt. A week ago, I would have said the Gators were definitely going to lose to Georgia. After their demolition of Oregon, I think that's still likely the case. But the win over Utah, and even more, the way they got the win over Utah, gives me hope that this team has a ceiling that I'm not sure any of us imagined just a couple of days ago. Billy Napier only has one game under his belt. It feels way too aggressive to start proclaiming the Gators' arrival as a true SEC contender. But the win over Utah is a major step forward in that direction. And more than anything, it has delivered a serious dose of the thing that was missing the most at the end of the Dan Mullen era. Hope. Thanks for listening to this article on the Read and Reaction audio audio articles. This article was titled, Gators Take Down Utes, Keys to Florida's 29-26 Victory Over Utah. It was written by Will Miles, read by Nick Knudsen. Please follow Read and Reaction for more content, and thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.